What's the word, y'all? I'm super, super hyped because the NBA season is finally here. So much basketball, and it all matters. I was locked in the preseason. And now that the season is officially here, y'all don't even know where we're going. So a couple nights ago, we got two games, and then tonight, I sat here and watched 13 different games. 13. So today, I'm giving you my first impression of 28 out of the 30 teams in the association because the 76ers and the Bucks haven't played just yet, but all the other ones have. Now, a couple of things I got to say up front is that usually it takes me 10 to 15 games to get a good enough sample size to have a genuine opinion about a team, about a player, about a coach, about a system, okay? So when I'm talking to you today, this is just based on game one, and this is not how I feel about the team for the entirety of the year because I'd be crazy to, to form an opinion right now after game one and the only reason i say that because i read my comment section i be on twitter i be seeing how y'all react to one game and it blows my mind don't do that because you either hyping yourself up for something just to be disappointed or vice versa you think your team is trash because they look bad on game one of the season and they might be great you never really know and the next thing is like I said, there was 13 games on. There's nobody in the world that will be able to be completely locked in to 13 games in one singular night. So I'm telling you that to say that some of these teams are not going to get talked about a ton because I wasn't stupidly locked into that game. But it is a very long NBA season, as you know, and you will get your flowers, your due diligence in due time. Also, because this is just a YouTube video, the time crunch, I want to promote my podcast, the Kenny Beach and Podcast, where we do all of this type of stuff in length, 45 minutes to an hour episodes. We're, again, locked in for this NBA season. So if you want more thought out opinions and stuff about the league, of course, that is a place to go. Are we ready? Are we officially ready? I think I want to go in chronological order because I have not been able to upload over the last couple of days because I, I was in Denver. I was there for the ring ceremony. I was there to see Denver Nuggets versus LA Lakers. And I have to say the hospitality was great. Shout out to Denver. And that was the best basketball atmosphere I had ever attended. And I would have been to some big games throughout NBA history. This is the number one atmosphere. It was electric. The team performed. I was a little bit afraid of it because sometimes I go to these ring ceremonies. And because the moment is about the ring, the team kind of loses the game and stuff. Nah, the Denver Nuggets was on that neck. Jokic looked like the best player in the world again. Super impressed with KCP again, as always. He's just one of the perfect role players to have alongside Jokic. And the, the bench, obviously, is going to be the big question mark about the Denver Nuggets this season. I thought, at least in this first game, they were able to piece it together pretty nicely. Peyton Watson looked pretty good. He was everywhere defensively. And then Reggie Jackson stepped on LeBron James' foot, so he got a clip. Uh, the Lakers, my impression of them is they look kind of they look kind of small, especially in comparison to the Denver Nuggets, who have a couple people on their team that are known for their vertical threat, like with Aaron Gordon or a Peyton Watson or even a, a, a Christian Brown. The Lakers don't really have that. So sometimes it felt like they were, I don't know, slower than the Nuggets or just weren't as big as them at the end of the day. And Anthony Davis started off this game. He looked great. He was going at Jokic. You know, they'd have been, well, I guess the Lakers have been yapping back at Mike Malone. So this was a game that was supposed to be circled on their calendar. And he finished with 17 points. And all of them was in the first half. I was disappointed. Again, I'm there as a neutral friend. I just want great basketball. And Andy Davis and Yoko was giving us a good game in the beginning. And then he didn't do anything in the second half. Found out LeBron James is on a minutes restriction this season. So uh, I was not very impressed with the Lakers' first game. But again, it's just game number one. Second game of the day saw the Suns go against the Warriors where the where Suns came out and got the win despite not having Bradley Beal. Devin Booker looked good as point book. There was sometimes when I was watching this game, I was like, that's not the right read or whatever. And he's trying to adjust to being a point guard. And then we got down to the nitty gritty late in the game. He made the great pass. So I think it was Josh Kogi in the corner. And he just showed why he's one of the best players in ball. And the Suns were able to win this game with Kevin Durant struggling. Um, uh, Eric Gordon struggled. Pretty much every shooter on their roster had a bad game except for Devin Booker and Yusuf Nurkic look really, really good compared to the Warriors, who, similar to what I said about the Lakers, just look really small out there without Draymond Green. Wiggins didn't rebound as good as you would want him to, considering he's one of the more athletic guys on the roster. Uh, I was excited to see Chris Paul, obviously, in that new role, but they didn't shoot the ball well. Kaminga missed the free throws. I, young guy, I'm not faulting him for that. And they just got outboarded, and Nurkic looked great. And book look great. Now let's get into today's games. Woo! 13 games? Are you serious, NBA? I know that they're, they're, they're not in the market of making it watchable for everyone, right? They want you to watch your favorite team. They don't expect people like me who are whose job is to watch every game. So they have four games starting at 6 and then three more games starting at 6.30 and you only got a quad box uh, league pass so I can only pick and choose. So let's start off with the Orlando Magic versus the Houston Rockets. I was, this is one of my favorite matchups of the day going into it because these are two of my league pass teams, at least I think. Orlando Magic lived up to it completely. They were hype. Um, they won this game by 30, is that 30 points? Sheesh. 
without Paolo Bancaro having to score at all. The most impressive thing about this whole thing is that Jonathan Isaac looked really good. And if you know me, you know I thought Jonathan Isaac coming into his draft class was going to be one of the most impactful players. Obviously, he hasn't really played much over the last couple of seasons. But when he was on the court, he was defensively on top of things. He got the tip dunk. He looked really, really good. And then Cole Anthony got that extension a couple of days ago. Shout out to Cole Anthony. It was surprising to me because I thought maybe he was going to be one of the trade pieces, potentially. Uh, but now that he signs extension, that's, that's not really a likelihood. And he's like, hey, I got my money and I'm still hit a ball. And he did that. That for the Houston Rockets, this was this team has had to incorporate so many new pieces, a uh, new coach. It did it didn't look very pretty. It did not look very pretty at all. But again, we're just talking about game one. The Orlando Magic defense was was like swallowing them up. They turned the ball over a ton. I don't know what to really say about a team that lost by 30, you know. So I'll just move on. To the nationally televised game, Boston versus New York. I, I cannot express how ex how exciting this game was. It was all Boston, all Boston for some time. The New York Knicks go on their little run. Isaiah Hardenstein is just one of those players that just makes the right play time in and time out. And then the Knicks get back into this game. And poor Zingas is just... I have never, again, just based on the one game, or I guess preseason two, this is as perfect as a scenario for a guy like Chris Dasper Zegas. For him to have this much space. And I mean, I mean, everybody's benefit from it, right? Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, everybody benefits from the fact that they have a seven foot two dude, seven foot three dude that can stretch the floor and shoot 35 to 40 percent from three. But also the Knicks were like going at him as if they did not read the scout report, is that he still does block a lot of shots. So like RJ Bear very early on kept going at him. Julius Randle tried to go at him, and he was like, nah, I'm not accepting none of that. So Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson shot a combined 11 of 43 from the field. You're usually going to get one of the two of them to at least have a positive impact on the game offensively. You got none of that, and yet you still lost by four. So this is a moral victory for the New York Knicks. Obviously, we know the Knicks are a good basketball team. They have one of the best and deepest benches in the association. It's just about getting their players on the right page, and game one just wasn't that. But... That, that Tatum MVP campaign is starting off pretty good in the beginning. I just, that's all I can really say. The Indiana Pacers won a game where they had 111 points going into the fourth quarter. They ended up with 143 points versus the Washington Wizards. I read an article earlier this season where, where somebody at the Ringer was predicting that the Indiana Pacers are going to be the fastest team in the re recent NBA history. And this game shows it. The best thing about the Indiana Pacers is that no matter what lineup they throw out there, they're going to have a point guard that makes the right decisions. Tyrese is obviously an elite level decision maker. Andrew Nimhart off the bench had double digit assists. And then they also have TJ McConnell. These are all guys that are like low turnover to high assist dudes. And they were just running and running. Bruce Brown looked like the steal of the offseason based on one game. And he got paid 20 M's and everybody was like, oh my God. And he looks like a steal right now based on, again, one game. His shot looked great. They were throwing lobs. They was running the floor. The crowd was live. It was it was a cool game if you were a Pacer fan or a neutral fan. It was maybe less cool if you watched a Wizards fan because Wizards fans, this is, I don't expect you to give up 143 points a night. But, <laughs> but the team just is not built to be very good right now. As you know, you traded away Porzingis. You traded away Bradley Beal. This is Year one of a, a legitimate rebuild. So, you know, you got you just gotta you gotta thug it out. You gotta thug it out. I know years in the past you've accepted mediocrity, but this is different because you're a mediocre with something to look forward to, which is the draft and things like that. Previously, you were mediocre to be the 10th seed, and you get the 10th overall pick, and you draft seven dudes with the 10th overall pick who are all NBA players, but none of them are great. And now you're playing your way to get a great player with the higher draft pick. You just gotta hit hit the picks. Bilal Kulabali and Garbage Time look good. I want to see more of him. That, that's my one complaint. I, I thought that because he started a couple of these games in preseason that he was going to start to start the season. He didn't. It's fine. But give him some minutes. Give him the ball. What are you playing for anyway? One of the dog fights of the night was the Indiana, I'm sorry, was the Minnesota Timberwolves versus Toronto Raptors. Another game that I was highly anticipating because... Because we only saw, what, 30 games of Car Anthony Towns last season? I don't know the exact number. We we have an idea about the Rudy Gobert Car Anthony Towns pairing, but we don't have, like, a, a crazy, crazy sample size, right? So I'm like, okay, every single game that the Timberwolves play this season, I'm locked in just to see if we'll ever see a, a, a version of the team where you can have Cat and Rudy Gobert, and it's effective on both sides of the floor. Today was not that day. <laughs> Today was not the day. Carthen Towns had a stinky game. Anthony Edwards did not have a good game either. Um, when Rudy Gobert is on the floor, they just can't really score. 
but yet the defense is going to be good. Rudy Gobert on the floor. So it's like, what what do you prioritize? I think you win this game, obviously, if uh, uh, Anthony Edwards or Carl Anthony Towns plays better. But it, it was it was a rough one out there, man. Some of the shots and slash decisions that Carl Anthony Towns had in this game was mind boggling. And I feel like I say that way too often about Carl Anthony Towns because he's he's a we know the talent level with Cat, but it's like can we consistently consistently get that where his now sharp shot chart because a lot of times he's playing with another big. It's like, here's some three-pointers, y'all. Here's the three-pointers. There was a time in this game where they were we had they had a lineup out there that was Cat, Nas Reed. It was Cat, Nas Reed, um, Cal Anderson, Mike Conley, and Shake Melton. And I'm thinking to myself, this lineup is awful. And it was. You know, that's just not a lineup that I think gives you enough of anything. It's not one way or the other. You know, the spacing is going to be mid. They basically run in two centers and a power four. It was just, it wasn't it. On the other side, uh, it was it was a rough game for the Toronto Raptors too. I, I think one of the questions about the Raptors is like, how would they score in the half court? Scotty Barnes filled up the stat sheet. I was very impressed with him. Obviously, we're talking about a year three player that is having the ball in his hands more this year than any other year. So his turnovers may be a little bit weird but for the most part i was impressed with his game impressed with the the premiere of dennis Schroeder in toronto oh john and defensively was on top of game and that's one of the reasons why anthony Edwards struggled in this when he was being guarded by oh john and but i was always putting the ball on the floor every time i see oh put the ball on the floor i smile a little bit especially if it ends in a bucket sometimes he puts the ball on the floor and it ends in a weird possession but when it ends in a bucket i'm smiling and they ended up dog fighting this game and, and got a win one of the games that i turned off because the Miami Heat looked like they had it wrapped up like six minutes ago. L little did I know, Detroit was put together a comeback. And I had to go rewatch the last six minutes. K. Cunningham looked amazing. The, the man ended up taking, I think, 27 shots. He ended up 13 of them, so 48% from the field. But it was at all three levels. And, so, and it was a little bit confusing watching it because it was at all three levels. And yet he got zero foul calls. I think it's just going to take time. I think I had the same complaint about him early last season where he just struggled to get the whistle there was definitely possessions in this game where i was like oh he should have got a call there he just didn't but he he was he was amazing this team the detroit pistons of course i'm talking about I, i've never really thought about how valuable bojan bogdanovich was until i watched today's game because the lack of spacing was tough and that's why i'm valuing this game for Cade on a higher level because the man put up 30 points and he had no space in whatsoever out there. Of course, they most of the time, they run like a double big. Killian Hayes ended up shooting 0 for 6 for 3. They just had not a lot of space. And Cade still, still ended up doing his thing. So, like, a Bojan Bogdanovic, whenever he comes back, is going to be impactful. Uh, Joe Harris is going to be impactful once we continue to see more minutes for him. But Cade is a stud. Surprised to see that Jaden Ivey only ended up playing 17 minutes. I, I'm not reading too much into that at all. But 17 minutes uh, was a lot less than I anticipated. Asar Thompson was everywhere defensively, specifically in that first quarter, where, of course, he had, like, three blocks on one possession. Uh, always impressed with his defensive efforts. It's just about, can we get his offensive game to catch up? And, and I think that'll happen with time. Tyler Heroes, you can tell just based on game one that he's playing with a, a big old chip on his shoulder. And today, the shots were not falling. But there are a lot of times in this game with his 24 shot attempts where I'm like, that is a good look. That is a good look. That is a good look. And none of them are falling. This team is definitely going to uh, benefit to having... Uh, Josh Richardson back because the rotation was a, was a bit weird. Bam's defense was Bam's defense, which I can look forward to every single night. Um, and Kyle Lowry, 32 minutes of cardio. Just that, that's that's what that was. <laughs> 30, he played 32 minutes and not just played 32 minutes. He was the point guard for 32 minutes and had one shot at him. That's like, that's like crazy. Because even Patrick Beverly, who's a low volume point guard, be getting up in more than a shot a game. I might have to rewatch all 32 of his minutes and figure out where the heck was he at and why did he only end up with one shot at him? Because this was not something I even noticed until after I had completed the game. I'm like, oh, snap. Yeah, one shot at him? Either way. We got a game winner on day two of the NBA season. Donovan Mitchell, big time shot. I didn't like the last play that the, the Brooklyn Nets drew up. Um, but okay, let's start with the Brooklyn Nets. One of my questions about the Nets, because I was pretty I was pretty confident about their defense going into the season. Not that they were going to be number one, but they'd be a positive defensive team because Ben, Mikael Bridges, Nicholas Claxton, these are all plus defenders. Then they got Dora Fitties. They got a lot of really good defensive players. My question was in the half court offense, what the heck do they do? And in game one, it was give it to Cam Thomas and tell him to cook. And like some people are 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 natural born like discourse. Cam is that. 
Again, I didn't like the last play, but ending up with 36 off the bench is just the cam way. You know, last year he had the, the with three games in a row, he gave us 40 and 40 and 40 while the Kyrie KD thing was happening. It didn't matter because Cam was doing his thing. Today was another one of them days, but of course they, they fell just short. Donovan Mitchell hit the big shot of the game, and, and the Cavs were able to get out of this barely. Um, DG to PG did not have a good game for his own standards. Um, but Max Strews? Max Struess hitting, what, six threes, seven threes in this game was impressive. Uh, I was definitely curious to see how they rebounded against the Brooklyn Nets because the Nets do, again, also have some really good rebounders like Dayron Sharp, Nicholas Clax, and Ben Simmons. I always gets like seven to nine a game. And obviously, there's miss, they're missing Jared Allen right now. And Evan Mobley, is, his frame is still just smaller. Luckily, he's played against Nicholas Clax, who's also not like this big old bruiser. So I was like, where are these extra rebounds coming from? Completely Max Struess's job. Max Struess came, came out and hit seven threes and had 12 rebounds. Like, it was nothing. What a pickup based on w one game. Another game that I was anticipating a ton was the Pelicans versus the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies mostly because, of course, no John Morant, no Steven Adams, no Brandon Clark, no Salty Aldama. I'm like, how are they going to score? They ended up with 104 points, and it was really just a Desmond Bain show. He ended up with 31 points, five assists. Anytime he was off the floor, it was it was a dreadful, dreadful watch for them offensively where they just need a second option, and they didn't get that. Xavier Tillman had one hell of a game for it to be like a plug-and-play center at the moment, but boy, when, when that man is not on the court, when Desmond Bain is not on the court, it is a tough watch, and it's a team that's not going to be able to rebound very well without Steven Adams and stuff, so they're really counting on on Xavier Tillman and Jaron Jackson Jr. to rebound. And, of course, Jaron is not really in his archetype at the moment. And when you go against a, a team that has Zion and Val and Larry Nance, th those are guys that are going to hit that glass. And they gave up 11 offensive rebounds, which is way too much. And a lot of that turned into uh, second-chance points while they also struggled to shoot the ball. So th the Grizzlies, again, we're just talking about game one. It, it wasn't it wasn't very pretty. And Taylor Jenkins, Jenkins in my opinion, has his hands full for the at least these 25 games because without Ja, the transition play wasn't nearly as good, obviously. And then the half-court game wasn't very good either. So it's like, man, where do we lay our hat on the offensive side? We can't just say Desmond take us to the promised land because Desmond can't play 48 minutes. So they need someone else to step up. And we don't know who that player is going to be just yet. The Pelicans. Oh, but the Pelicans, we saw 200 minutes of Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson last season. 200 minutes. That's nothing. So anytime they get to play together, I'm hyped because I just don't know if they're a good fit together because we have such a small sample size. Today, they look like a really good fit. Was there one play, two plays with Brandon Ingram threw the lob up to Zion? Zion caught a couple bodies. Jaron hung with him a little bit in this one. I'm not trying to discredit Jaron, the DPOY. He got him a couple times, but Zion looked pretty good. Um, I think he created more shots than just the three assists that he ended up with. Obviously, you can't expect all of the shots to fall, but they, they look good. Uh, it's an exciting, exciting team. You're going to get the highlights. You're going to get the moments. This was a fun watch if you're a Pelicans fan or a neutral fan like me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I almost forgot to mention this man. Matt Ryan. Me and the guy. So so this is the way we, we do things usually. Uh, we all had a game. So we're in Discord talking about the games today and we watch it, right? And then somebody say, who is 30? What is the number? Who is 37 on the Pelicans? I'm like, 37 on the Pelicans? Who is? And I look, I'm like, who is this man that just hit that three? And I remember two days ago, they picked up Matt Ryan off the off the streets. And he immediately came in and hit three three-pointers. And that's something that they needed because a lot of times with Zion and Val and even Herb Jones, who is a has become a, a adequate three-point shooter, teams don't trust him, is that that the spacing is clogged and clogged and clogged. And Matt Ryan, if he's able to come in and give you a couple threes a game, is a is a plus. So shout out to Matt Ryan. Oh, the Bulls. Talk about turmoil already. The players are arguing with each other. Billy Donovan is telling the people, we like that type of stuff. Awful, awful game. But because my expectations are low, I'm not even tripping about it. I'm such on a, on a, on a cloud high that, that we got basketball get back. I'm not even mad that my team lost by 20 points today. But I am mad that my team lost by 20 points because the players that I was expecting to be good weren't good. Uh, and I'm talking about Patrick Williams and Kobe White. Uh, I'm giving Kobe White a pass. Um, I, I guess I give Pat a pass to... It's just ugly. The one thing is the Bulls got a 42 three-point shots, which I, I don't know what the season high was last year, but the Bulls were not a high-value three-point shooter. Now, we shot 28% from the three today, but we got more three-point looks today than I remember us getting at all last season. So there's a, 
a silver lining into things because we played basketball as if it was 2009 last year. So if we catch up as far as three-point attempts, I think the percentage is going to go up to at least league average. So we should be able to be in a lot of these games. But if you're taking 42 threes and you're only making 12 of them, and then your star player, Zach Levine, shoots 25%, the other guys is a... Uh, what, what are those things? Revolving door defensively, you're not going to win games. OKC is one of the youngest teams in the league, and they're good. They're well coached. Shea was a, a monster. Didn't matter who we threw on him. When we had Alex Caruso, who's an all-defensive player, he made it work. When we had Patrick Williams on him, who's not an all-defensive player, but is a plus defensive player, it didn't matter. We threw big bodies, small bodies, and Shea picked it apart. And they have more depth than I think a lot of people realize. Because even like today, Usman Zhang came in and hit three threes. I'm like, I didn't even know he had that in his game. I, I bet the scouting report did not say close out heavy on him because that's not who he has been throughout his first year of his NBA career. He hit three today. One last thing about this game. There, there's one thing that there's this new trend going around the association. Um, Reggie Jackson, Javon Carter, and now Jalen Williams have have succumbed to this to this trend of mismatched shoes. The, the worst. I can't. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. It's not for me. But J Dub had an orange shoe and a black and white shoe on at the same time, and it didn't look good. It never looks good. They call Reggie Jackson the accessory king, and that's so bad. Javon Carter's been hooping in mismatched shoes since I was watching him in high school. It's ugly. It's bad. Cut it out. Oh, my boy, Casey Wallace. I was really disappointed that I wasn't able to go to this game. But there was so much basketball on that I couldn't buy tickets because I would have missed the other 12 games going to this one game, a game that I was pretty sure my team was going to lose. But my boy, Casey was in town again. I wish I would have been able to be there to watch him hoop because he played very well. Um, Wimby's premier was cool, I guess. When we got to the fourth quarter, the first two quarters, it was kind of nothing because he was in foul trouble. And then that fourth quarter came around, he had a couple shots, and then his team iced him. Didn't touch the ball again. But the, the rookie that stole the show was Derek Lively. Derek Lively was a guy that, again, I don't watch college ball. I always have to say that. Um, a guy that when he was drafted by the Mavericks, and they, the Mavericks had to make a couple deals in order to get Derek Lively, right? Um, the homie's like, that's a perfect pickup for him. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Rim running center, the fan, whatever, whatever. I thought he was going to be a lot rawer of a prospect than what he just showed. I watched two of their preseason games, I think, and he didn't have that much of an impact because he's a rim-running, rim-protecting big, and a lot of times it takes those players a few years to become positive players because you have to think, you got to learn the game of the NBA, not just the game of basketball, right? So these archetypes of the Jackson Hayes and, and things like that just a lot of times either don't work out or takes years to work out. This man came onto the scene today and he was what, the second best player, third best player for the Dallas Mavericks? The second most impactful as far as getting the crowd involved with his tip dunks and his blocks and stuff like that behind Luka Doncic, so he was amazing. The starting lineup for the Dallas Mavericks confused me. I didn't definitely didn't expect to see Derrick Jones Jr. starting. Shout out to, to my guy. Um, and also Maxi Kleeb at the five. I for sure thought that it would be lively because of preseason or Rashawn Holmes who got a DMP uh, coach's decision. But they ended up going with Maxi, who hit two threes, but he also like airballed four. So <laughs> what could I say? Luka Doncic, Luka Doncic got the ice, yada, yada, yada. Um, love the starting lineup that the Spurs threw out there. I thought that, that maybe Trey Jones was going to stay as a starting point guard, but he looked good coming off the bench. So I like the bigger lineup where they allowed Jeremy to be this point forward type thing. And it's, it's cool. I just don't think that in their starting lineup, they have a lot of playmakers. And that might prevent Wimby from getting as many touches as he deserves. But again, we're talking about a team that is so young that they'll make it. And then lastly, the last game of the day. Oh, no, it's not the last game of the day. Did I forget one? Because I didn't talk about the Kings yet, did I? I don't think I talked about the Kings yet. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. So cool, cool, cool. Uh, I, I'm glad I, I remember that. This was a game that got so little attention for me. Um, the one thing I noticed is that the Utah Jazz ended up, st they started off in the zone and that just allowed Harrison Barnes to get as many open shots as he want. Malik Monk got the poster on my boy Chris Dunn, whatever, whatever. Um, I was excited to see John Collins because he wants to be a Hall of Famer. I don't know if you saw that quote. He said, when it was all said and done, he wants to be looked at a Hall of Famer. And yet the Hall of Famer, a uh, potential future Hall of Famer was sitting in the corner doing the exact same stuff that he was asked to do last year. And that was a little bit disheartening for me. And that's why I didn't watch much of this game. Also, just knew that the Kings were the better team and was going to win. So, and, and that's that's what that's what happened. Um, <laughs> simply put. And now the last game of the day, which was Scoot Henderson. No! I forgot to talk about more games! Because I didn't talk about the, the Hawks, did I? Alright, nope. I did not talk about the Hawks, who disappointed me today. But again, just day one. 
Um, both the both of the point guards in this game disappointed me. Okay, Trey Young and Lamelo. You're like, whoa, Lamelo ended up leading this team to win. Absolutely, he had a half of basketball that was awful. But one thing about Lamelo is that I am a firm believer in Lamelo Ball as a player. I, I know there's some discourse around him. Oh, does he impact winning? I just think that's asinine because. Every time he's had a, success, a healthy team around him, he's helped this team win 40 games. And the roster is poorly constructed, and yet he helps them win 40 games when they're healthy. So it's, I don't I don't subscribe to the idea that he doesn't impact winning. But the thing that I, I do subscribe to is that he does not get to the basket nearly enough for a guy that's an all-star talent, man. And when he does get to the basket, he just avoids contact too much. There was times in this game where he's guarded by Trey Young, who's all of five foot eleven, And instead of using the, the six foot seven frame that he had, he decided to take a fading mid-range jump shot or a step back three. He's like, LaMelo, can we get the, the thing if LaMelo can add getting to the basket and finishing to at the basket in his art like in his in his bag, it's over with. It's over with. Because the playmaking is nine out of ten. He would have so much more assists if he had players that are better. But he, again, his teammates were great today. He just needs to be able to add that last part, draw some fouls, and don't shy away from the content. Uh, the contact, but whatever. That's not what we're really talking about. Trey Young also settles a ton. Um, I, I guess it kind of makes sense because at least early in this game when he did try to go to the basket, Mark Williams was there. Mark Williams was is like a tower over there. He, if he's not black and shy, he's preventing you from getting a good look on it. Um, so yeah, Trey Young and DeJounte Murray combined for 7 of 20, 32. Yeah, that's bad. They were combined 1 of 12 from 3. That's bad. The team was 5 of 29. That's bad. Jalen Johnson, though, if you watch the Kenny Beach podcast, you should you should have been hip to the Jalen Johnson hype because I was here for it. Yeah, the Hawks just did not have a, a very good game. While the Charlotte Hornets looked like a competent NBA team, uh, Brandon Miller hit a couple really big shots down the stretch. So shout out to the Rook. And is there any that Mark Williams, I mentioned his name, draft him in fantasy this year. Super happy with his double-double. I believe we can finally get to the last game. I'm strolling. I'm strolling just to make sure I have talked about everything except for Clippers versus Timberwolves. School Henderson looked like a rookie. Not much more I can really say about that. Four assists to four turnovers. Um, I was extremely, and I mean extremely disappointed in the production from DeAndre Aiden. For him to say he gonna be out here dominating, first game of the year ended with four points, five, five fouls. Like, never should you finish as the starting center of a team with more fouls than points. And that's what he did today. Luckily, his backup is Robert Williams, and Robert Williams is a, is a good player, but boy, it was a, it was a rough watch. I, they had the little fake run at the end because at one point they were down by 30. That's when I turned the game off. They ended up losing by just a little bit over double digits, but it was a, it was a lot worse than that, I promise you, okay? Clippers were running. The Clippers were having fun. Russell Westbrook looked electric, throwing the dime. You got the one pass from Bones Highland to Russ, and he dunk. And anytime Russ does the dunk and he looks in the crowd and yells, that gets me hype. I'm not even a fan of the organization, you feel? Uh, before the season, Paul George said he was on his bully again. Today, I saw him lock in offensively and defensively, which is promising for the organization. And, of course, they were playing without Terrence Mann, but Terrence Mann added to this rotation or, again, starting lineup because Robert Covington took those starting lineup minutes um, because of the – was it illness? I don't even really know why Terrence Mann didn't play, but he didn't play today. Is that all? Is that all to say, boys? Uh, the first 28 teams have played, and those are my impressions. Again, if you want a longer version of this, the Kenny Beaton podcast is the way to go. Uh, even this was way longer than I anticipated. But we got to talk hoops, man. I'll be back tomorrow. Peace.